to the Virgo Potenz YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, I invite you to visit the Virgo Potenz website at virgopotenz.org. Virgo Potenz has articles, traditional Latin Mass resources, transcribed sermons, prayers in English and Latin, narrated videos of the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, and a spiritual warfare page. I offer the content on the website and YouTube channel for free, but this work is a full-time apostolate and your support is needed. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by praying for me, becoming a patron of Virgo Potenz on Patreon, and or by purchasing one of my eBooks. If you'd prefer to give me a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by buying one of my eBooks. Links to my eBooks as well as to Patreon can be found at virgopotenz.org. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Christ Before Pilate by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich In this vision, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describes what happened when Christ was brought before Pilate to be put on trial. The following Virgo Potenz production is a narrated video of chapters 15 and 17 from the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, narrated by Tony Capo Bianco. The text of the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ is in the public domain. All of the pictures used in this video are also in the public domain. Chapter 15 Jesus is taken before Pilate. The malicious enemies of our Savior led him through the most public part of the town to take him before Pilate. The procession wended its way slowly down the north side of the mountain of Sion, then passed through that section on the eastern side of the temple, called Acre, towards the palace and tribunal of Pilate, which were seated on the northwest side of the temple, facing a large square. Caiaphas, Anas, and many others of the chief council walked first in festival attire. They were followed by a multitude of scribes and many other Jews, among whom were the false witnesses and the wicked Pharisees who had taken the most prominent part in accusing Jesus. Our Lord followed at a short distance. He was surrounded by a band of soldiers and led by the archers. The multitude thronged on all sides and followed the procession thundering forth the most fearful oaths and imprecations, while groups of persons were hurrying to and fro, pushing and jostling one another. Jesus was stripped of all save his undergarment, which was stained and soiled by the filth which had been flung upon it. A long chain was hanging round his neck, which struck his knees as he walked. His hands were pinioned as on the previous day, and the archers dragged him by the ropes which were fastened round his waist. He tottered rather than walked, and was almost unrecognizable from the effects of his sufferings during the night. He was colorless, haggard, his face swollen and even bleeding, and his merciless persecutors continued to torment him each moment more and more. They had gathered together a large body of the dregs of the people, in order to make his present disgraceful entrance into the city a parody on his triumphal entrance on Palm Sunday. They mocked, and with derisive gestures called him king, and tossed in his path stones, bits of wood, and filthy rags. They made game of, and, by a thousand taunting speeches, mocked him, during this pretended triumphal entry. In the corner of a building not far from the house of Caiaphas, the afflicted mother of Jesus, with John and Magdalene, stood watching for him. Her soul was ever united to his, but propelled by her love, she left no means untried which could enable her really to approach him. She remained at the cenacle for some time after her midnight visit to the tribunal of Caiaphas, powerless and speechless from grief, but when Jesus was dragged forth from his prison to be again brought before his judges, she arose, cast her veil and cloak about her, and said to Magdalene and John, let us follow my son to Pilate's court. I must again look upon him. They went to a place through which the procession must pass, and waited for it. The mother of Jesus knew that her son was suffering dreadfully, but never could she have conceived the deplorable, the heart-rending condition to which he was reduced by the brutality of his enemies. 
Her imagination had depicted him to her as suffering fearfully, but yet supported and illuminated by sanctity, love, and patience. Now, however, the sad reality burst upon her. First in the procession appeared the priests, those most bitter enemies of her divine son. They were decked in flowing robes, but ah, terrible to say, instead of appearing resplendent in their character of priests of the Most High, they were transformed into priests of Satan. For no one could look upon their wicked countenances without beholding there, portrayed in vivid colors, the evil passions with which their souls were filled, deceit, infernal cunning, and a raging anxiety to carry out that most tremendous of crimes, the death of their Lord and Savior, the only Son of God. Next followed the false witnesses, his perfidious accusers, surrounded by the vociferating populace, and last of all himself, her son Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, loaded with chains, scarcely able to support himself, but pitilessly dragged on by his infernal enemies, receiving blows from some, buffets from others, and from the whole assembled rabble curses, abuse, and the most scurrilous language. He would have been perfectly unrecognizable even to her maternal eyes, stripped as he was of all save a torn remnant of his garment, had she not instantly marked the contrast between his behavior and that of his vile tormentors. He alone, in the midst of persecution and suffering, looked calm and resigned, and far from returning blow for blow, never raised his hands, but in acts of supplication to his eternal father for the pardon of his enemies. As he approached, she was unable to restrain herself any longer, but exclaimed in thrilling accents, Alas, is that my son? Ah, yes, I see that is my beloved son. Oh, Jesus, my Jesus! When the procession was almost opposite, Jesus looked upon her with an expression of the greatest love and compassion. This look was too much for the heartbroken mother. She became, for the moment, totally unconscious, and John and Magdalene endeavored to carry her home. But she quickly roused herself and accompanied the beloved disciple to Pilate's palace. The inhabitants of the town of Ophel were all gathered together in an open space to meet Jesus. But far from administering comfort, they added a fresh ingredient to his cup of sorrow. They inflicted upon him that sharp pang which must ever be felt by those who see their friends abandon them in the hour of adversity. Jesus had done much for the inhabitants of Ophel, but no sooner did they see him reduced to such a state of misery and degradation than their faith was shaken. They could no longer believe him to be a king, a prophet, the Messiah, and the Son of God. The Pharisees jeered and made game of them on account of the admiration they had formerly expressed for Jesus. Look at your king now, they exclaimed. Do homage to him. Have you no congratulations to offer him now that he is about to be crowned and seated on his throne? All his boasted miracles are at an end. The high priest has put an end to his tricks in witchcraft. Notwithstanding the remembrance which these poor people had of the miracles and wonderful cures which had been performed under their very eyes by Jesus, Notwithstanding the great benefits he had bestowed upon them, their faith was shaken by beholding him, thus derided and pointed out as an object of contempt by the high priest and the members of the Sanhedrin, who were regarded in Jerusalem with the greatest veneration. Some went away doubting, while others remained and endeavored to join the rabble. But they were prevented by the guards, who had been sent by the Pharisees to prevent riots and confusion. Chapter 17. Jesus Before Pilate. It was about eight in the morning, according to our method of counting time, when the procession reached the palace of Pilate. Anas, Caiaphas, and the chiefs of the Sanhedrin stopped at a part between the forum and the entrance to the praetorium, where some stone seats were placed for them. The brutal guards dragged Jesus to the foot of the flight of stairs, which led to the judgment seat of Pilate. Pilate was reposing in a comfortable chair on a terrace which overlooked the forum, and a small three-legged table stood by his side, on which was placed the insignia of his office and a few other things. 
He was surrounded by officers and soldiers dressed with the magnificence usual in the Roman army. The Jews and the priests did not enter the praetorium for fear of defiling themselves, but remained outside. When Pilate saw the tumultuous procession enter and perceived how shamefully the cruel Jews had treated their prisoner, he arose and addressed them in a tone as contemptuous as could have been assumed by a victorious general towards the vanquished chief of some insignificant village. What are you come about so early? Why have you ill-treated this prisoner so shamefully? Is it not possible to refrain from thus tearing to pieces and beginning to execute your criminals even before they are judged? They made no answer, but shouted out to the guards, Bring him on, bring him to be judged. And then turning to Pilate, they said, Listen to our accusations against this malefactor, for we cannot enter the tribunal, lest we defile ourselves. Scarcely had they finished these words when a voice was heard to issue from the midst of the dense multitude. It proceeded from a venerable-looking old man of imposing stature, who exclaimed, You are right in not entering the praetorium, for it has been sanctified by the blood of innocence. There is but one person who has a right to enter, and who alone can enter, because he alone is pure as the innocents who were massacred there. The person who uttered these words in a loud voice and then disappeared among the crowd was a rich man of the name of Zadok, first cousin to Obed, the husband of Veronica. Two of his children were among the innocents whom Herod had caused to be butchered at the birth of our Savior. Since that dreadful moment he had given up the world, and together with his wife, followed the rules of the Essenians. He had once seen our Savior at the house of Lazarus, and there heard him discourse. And the sight of the barbarous manner in which he was dragged before Pilate recalled to his mind all he himself had suffered when his babies were so cruelly murdered before his eyes, and he determined to give this public testimony of his belief in the innocence of Jesus. The persecutors of our Lord were far too provoked at the haughty manner which Pilate assumed towards them, and at the humble position they were obliged to occupy to take any notice of the words of a stranger. The brutal guards dragged our Lord up the marble staircase and led him to the end of the terrace, from whence Pilate was conferring with the Jewish priests. The Roman governor had often heard of Jesus, although he had never seen him, and now he was perfectly astonished at the calm dignity of deportment of a man brought before him in so pitiable a condition. The inhuman behavior of the priests and ancients both exasperated him and increased his contempt for them, and he informed them pretty quickly that he had not the slightest intention of condemning Jesus without satisfactory proofs of the truth of their accusations. What accusation do you bring against this man, he said, addressing the priests in the most scornful tone possible. If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee, replied the priests sullenly. Take him, said Pilate, and judge you him according to your law. Thou knowest well, replied they, that it is not lawful for us to condemn any man to death. The enemies of Jesus were furious. They wished to have the trial finished off, and their victim executed as quickly as possible, that they might be ready at the festival day to sacrifice the paschal lamb, not knowing, miserable wretches as they were, that he whom they had dragged before the tribunal of an idolatrous judge, into whose house they would not enter, for fear of defiling themselves before partaking of the figurative victim, that he and he alone was the true paschal lamb, of which the other was only the shadow. Pilate, however, at last ordered them to produce their accusations. These accusations were three in number, and they brought forward ten witnesses to attest the truth of each. Their great aim was to make Pilate believe that Jesus was the leader of a conspiracy against the emperor, in order that he might condemn him to death as a rebel. They themselves were powerless in such matters, being allowed to judge none but religious offenses. Their first endeavor was to convict him of seducing the people, exciting them to rebellion, and of being an enemy to public peace and tranquility. To prove these charges, they brought forward some false witnesses and declared likewise that he violated the Sabbath and even profaned it by curing the sick upon that day. At this accusation, Pilate interrupted them and said in a jeering tone, 
It is very evident you were none of you ill yourselves. Had you been so, you would not have complained of being cured on the Sabbath day. He seduces the people and inculcates the most disgusting doctrines. He even says that no person can attain eternal life unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood. Pilate was quite provoked at the intense hatred which their words and countenances expressed, and turning from them with a look of scorn, exclaimed, You most certainly must wish to follow his doctrines and to attain eternal life, for you are thirsting for both his body and blood. The Jews then brought forward the second accusation against Jesus, which was that he forbade the people to pay tribute to the emperor. These words roused the indignation of Pilate, as it was his place to see that all the taxes were properly paid, and he exclaimed in an angry tone, That is a lie. I must know more about it than you. This obliged the enemies of our Lord to proceed to the third accusation, which they did in words such as these. Although this man is of obscure birth, he is the chief of a large party. When, at their head, he denounces curses upon Jerusalem and relates parables of double meaning concerning a king who is preparing a wedding feast for his son, the multitude whom he had gathered together on a mountain endeavored once to make him their king. But it was sooner than he intended. His plans were not matured. Therefore he fled and hid himself. Latterly, he has come forward much more. It was but the other day that he entered Jerusalem at the head of a tumultuous assembly, who, by his orders, made the people rend the air with acclamations of, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed be the empire of our father David, which is now beginning! He obliges his partisans to pay him regal honors, and tells them that he is the Christ, the anointed of the Lord, the Messiah, the King promised to the Jews, and he wishes to be addressed by these fine titles. Ten witnesses gave testimony concerning these things. The last accusation, that of Jesus causing himself to be called king, made some impression upon Pilate. He became a little thoughtful, left the terrace, and, casting a scrutinizing glance on Jesus, went into the adjoining apartment and ordered the guards to bring him alone into his presence. Pilate was not only superstitious, but likewise extremely weak-minded and susceptible. He had often, during the course of his pagan education, heard mention made of sons of his gods, who had dwelt for a time upon earth. He was likewise fully aware that the Jewish prophets had long foretold that one should appear in the midst of them, who should be the anointed of the Lord, their Savior and Deliverer from slavery, and that many among the people believed this firmly. He remembered likewise the kings from the east had come to Herod, the predecessor of the present monarch of that time, to pay homage to a newly born king of the Jews, and that Herod had on this account given orders for the massacre of the innocents. He had often heard of the traditions concerning the Messiah and the king of the Jews, and even examined them with some curiosity, although, of course, being a pagan, without the slightest belief, had he believed at all, he would probably have agreed with the Herodians and with those Jews who expected a powerful and victorious king. With such impressions, the idea of the Jews accusing the poor, miserable individual whom they had brought into his presence of setting himself up as the promised king and Messiah, of course, appeared to him absurd. But as the enemies of Jesus brought forward these charges in proof of treason against the emperor, he thought it proper to interrogate him privately concerning them. Art thou the king of the Jews? said Pilate, looking at our Lord and unable to repress his astonishment at the divine expression of his countenance. Jesus made answer, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or have others told it thee of me? Pilate was offended that Jesus should think it possible for him to believe such a thing, and answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee up to me as deserving of death. What hast thou done? Jesus answered majestically, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate was somewhat moved by these solemn words and said to him in a more serious tone, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. 
For this was I born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate looked at him, and rising from his seat said, The truth! What is truth? They then exchanged a few more words, which I do not now remember, and Pilate returned to the terrace. The answers and deportment of Jesus were far beyond his comprehension, but he saw plainly that his assumption of royalty would not clash with that of the emperor, for that it was to no worldly kingdom that he had laid claim, whereas the emperor cared for nothing beyond this world. He therefore again addressed the chief priests from the terrace and said, I find no cause in him. The enemies of Jesus became furious and uttered a thousand different accusations against our Savior, but he remained silent, solely occupied in praying for his base enemies, and replied not when Pilate addressed him in these words, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, in how many things they accuse thee! Pilate was filled with astonishment and said, I see plainly that all they allege is false. But his accusers, whose anger continued to increase, cried out, You find no cause in him? Is it no crime to incite the people to revolt in all parts of the kingdom? To spread his false doctrines, not only here, but in Galilee likewise? The mention of Galilee made Pilate pause. He reflected for a moment and then asked, Is this man a Galilean and a subject of Herod's? They made answer, He is, his parents lived at Nazareth, and his present dwelling is in Capernaum. Since that is the case, replied Pilate, take him before Herod. He is here for the festival, and can judge him at once, as he is his subject. Jesus was immediately led out of the tribunal, and Pilate dispatched an officer to Herod to inform him that Jesus of Nazareth, who was his subject, was about to be brought to him to be judged. Pilate had two reasons for following this line of conduct. In the first place, he was delighted to escape having to pass sentence himself, as he felt very uncomfortable about the whole affair. And in the second place, he was glad of an opportunity of pleasing Herod, with whom he had had a disagreement, for he knew him to be very curious to see Jesus. The enemies of our Lord were enraged at being thus dismissed by Pilate in the presence of the whole multitude, and gave vent to their anger by ill-treating him even more than before. They pinioned him afresh, and then ceased not overwhelming him with curses and blows, as they led him hurriedly through the crowd, towards the palace of Herod, which was situated at no great distance from the forum. Some Roman soldiers had joined the procession. During the time of the trial, Claudia Proclus, the wife of Pilate, had sent him frequent messages to intimate that she wished extremely to speak to him, and when Jesus was sent to Herod, she placed herself on a balcony and watched the cruel conduct of his enemies with mingled feelings of fear, grief, and horror. End of chapters 15 and 17 from the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. Narrated by Tony Capo Bianco. This has been a Virgo Potens production. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. Thanks for watching, and may the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.